Okay, we're back here live in San Francisco for the Red Hat Summit. This is theCUBE, SiliconANGLE's flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. I'm joined with Stu Miniman, Ebon.org. And our next guest is uh, Radhesh Balakrishnan, general manager, virtualization of, and OpenStack of Red Hat. Uh, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. Um, Congratulations, obviously Dell is announcing uh, some stuff. So tell us your thoughts of this show. Um, so, you know, first of all, this is a day that we look for, or these days are the ones that we look for the most as Red Hat employees, because, you know, top customers across the globe come here. We get to share not just the finished products, but also the roadmap of where we're taking this. And so if you fundamentally believe in this community-powered innovation model, what better opportunity than to test the ideas, get feedback, and start delivering, you know, get back to our you know, barn, if you will, and then start building things that customers ask for. So it's an, so all in all, it's a great opportunity to interact with customers and partners. Before we get into some of the OpenStack conversation, I want to just get your personal perspective. We were talking before we came on that the revolution of the computer industry, even going back to the 30th anniversary of the Mac, where I was attending in the, at, with, with, the, with the Apple back in Cupertino, and we talked with IBM earlier, 50th anniversary of the mainframe. Open source came on the scene with Linux big time. Mm -hmm. That operating system kind of decoupled from the hardware. Yep. Hey, interesting concept. Now today, that decoupling is going a step further. How do you feel? I mean, what's your take on this? And, and, and how significant, and you live and breathe it every day with a lot of passion at Red Hat. Explain to the folks on how important this is. Why is this such a big deal? Yeah, so let me come at it from a slightly different perspective. You know, sometimes I wake up and pinch myself and, you know, to really believe that, hey, it's real, right? Because 10 years ago, right, I, I have a history of having worked in a proprietary organization for a fairly large number of years. At that point in time, this open source was this unknown thing, unknown amount of risks, et cetera, et cetera. Now look at, you know, kind of the public cloud as a starting point. We're not going into OpenStack yet. Nine out of ten clouds out there are built on open source technology. So it's not a, hey, can open source be there? But it's a, hey, what are we using it for? That's one thing. The second thing is any bleeding edge innovation that you talk about, you know, be it big data, et cetera, et cetera, it's all in open world, right? So it's almost like the you know, planets have come in alignment at the perfect time, and I consider myself personally lucky, right? Really, I mean it, personally lucky to be at this juncture when the customers want to reinvent themselves, the industry is reinventing itself, and we have a very catalytic role to play, so. You know. Padma Warrior said on stage yesterday, every, every company is now a technology company, they have to be, it's not mm -hmm. just one little corner of the organization, it's everything, yep. um, and this is changing the game, and, and, and the folks that, that have Red Hat, you guys have a lot of enterprise customers mm -hmm. that use Red Hat on a commercial basis yeah. and support it, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And it's your business model is doing yeah. so well. Um, but now they want to extend that capability to the cloud. Yeah. And they see Amazon out there. They, they put some stuff out there, do some shadow ID. Still they complain about the lumpiness SLA and that's all been talked about, well documented. Amazon's trying to become more <laughs> enterprise grade. Yeah. But OpenStack has been clearly the, the, uh, the bridge for a lot of enterprise that they mm -hmm. want to cross for mm -hmm. the flexibility. Yeah. Where are you guys at OpenStack? And, and, and how baked out is it? Is it just, standing up, are people using it? Can you talk specifically about some successes around OpenStack and where you guys are at? Sure, you know, I would parse your question into multiple parts if you don't <laughs> mind. And you know, just to frame the conversation, you know, it's not almost as if customers are saying, hey look, we want to get to OpenStack. Yes, there are some that say that too, we love them to death for that. The reality is customers are saying, look, I want to do two things in my infrastructure. Reduce the cost, bring in the agility, right? And at the same time, make sure that the legacy infrastructure that is in there continues to you know, <coughs> deliver an SLA, et cetera. So our you know, gambit in this is actually not just OpenStack, but also the other piece parts that are needed to make the transition from where they are to where they want to get to as seamless as possible. It starts with KVM, it starts with Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization, it starts with cloud forms as a technology to be able to manage a vSphere environment as well as a you know, Rev environment and then enter OpenStack into the picture, you bring in a new breed of applications, new kind of infrastructure where you potentially are rewiring and reinventing you know, compute storage and network layers all over again, setting yourself up for the future, right? Now in that context, the beauty of all of that is you've finally been you know, liberated from the tragedy of the past, which is you got shackled by one proprietary vendor or other. Right? It's truly, truly open, right? So that's the context we are operating in. Now you had a question about, hey, where are we seeing traction, et cetera, right? So if you look at the you know, last year and change, 
In July is when we GA the product. Uh, so we announced two products in uh, July last year at our summit. You know, we're doing it a little earlier this year. Uh, first is um, a combination of RHEL and OpenStack, engineered together so that the piece parts needed for you to have an environment that is predictable can come into an enterprise. The second one is a product called Red Hat Cloud Infrastructure. Now the beauty of Red Hat Cloud Infrastructure is it's got traditional virtualization, it's got RHEL OpenStack platform, and it's got a common management across both. And the beauty of that is it can also manage public cloud resources as well as vSphere resources, if you will, right? So finally we have an offering which is truly open that can help bridge what you have and what you can get to. And what we're seeing from customers is that, if you look across the globe, we're engaged deeply with you know, three-digit number of customers. The cash registers, I'm happy to say, has already started ringing, if you will. Um, we're seeing traction in uh, financial vertical, which is sort of uh, you know, the home base, if you will, of uh, Red Hat in general. Uh, telco vertical, fueled further by the whole NFV focus, if you will. And then research and education. And you know, I'm hoping you know, I can share some of the customer names as well. So if you look at um, NCI, which is the National Computing Institute in Australia, it, this is a research body which provides the infrastructure for uh, weather research in Australia, for example. So, you know, they started with a couple of hundred nodes in terms of OpenStack, the eventual footprint is going to be 7,000 nodes, something like that. Or Midokura, which is an NFE provider, you know, they are private cloud, and as well as how they develop software and test and repro solutions is based on OpenStack. You know, talk about every company becoming a technology company and it's being embedded into the way you do business. That's a shining example as well. Or, you know, we have a few ones like uh, National uh, Nanyang uh, Technical University in Singapore or University of Portic, Portugal, etc. who are all doing fundamentally one thing, which is, hey, look, we have seen the pain points of the old infrastructure. We see the possibility of OpenStack. Now let's pick the use cases that make the most sense for us to bring OpenStack into and then think about a journey thereof. So it's a great place to be in from a traction and adoption perspective. And the cash register is your business model of, of, of that's been tried and true as a subscription. Same, yeah. same, no changes on Absolutely. the business model in terms Absolutely. of these yeah. deployments. Yeah. It, not just the business model, which is the same, right? Look, the, an average Red Hat customer has trust on Red Hat for a couple of things. One is that the open innovation has been hardened enough so that they can deploy it in their production environment and actually you know, not get fired and in fact get a promotion hopefully, right? So that's the you know, first level of trust they have. Second is a, a, a truly wide partner ecosystem. You know, I just saw Sam uh, talk a little bit earlier with you, right? You know, Dell is a shining example of you know, when Linux was trying to become RHEL, if you will. Michael Dell himself, you know, voted with his wallet to partner with Red Hat. I mean, that's the history, and we kind of saw history repeating itself in December at Dell World when, you know, Dell and uh, Michael Dell himself said, "Hey, look, we are picking Red Hat for OpenStack." Right. So, from a partner ecosystem perspective, and now he's a private company. He's got a lot more flexibility. He's not have to, to chase the, the whole uh, Wall Street mentality. He can do some innovative things. Absolutely. There are not too many companies claiming to be the world's <laughs> largest, uh, you know, startup if you will, yeah, right? Yeah. So he can be creative again. Yeah. So Absolutely. what is some of the creativity you're seeing from, from folks like Dell who see the future? And, the, and that's classic early adopters, people who know what they're doing, Michael yeah. certainly does. Yeah. Um, what kind of creativity are you seeing with, uh, with uh, RHEL and OpenStack? Yeah, to, fundamentally comes down to the jointly aligned mission and vision we have together, which is we as industrial leaders have the opportunity and it behooves us to make it enterprise ready as possible. So now, let's parse what does enterprise ready really mean? First is you need to have a product experience where you can install, configure, manage entire life cycle of it. So that's very, very important. Second is that you need to be able to piece it together with what you have as well as the newer stuff around SDN and other you know, beautiful three-letter acronyms which are fueling further innovation in there. So if you look at both the counts, you know, we are so aligned that you know, we're working so fast. I mean, it was December that we announced. Today, I'm happy to say that we've generally available the joint solutions with uh, you know, Dell, right? That's the pace at which we're working together. You know, that's a lot, lot of creativity, a lot of guts, and a lot of uh, purposefulness in terms of what we want to do that I'm seeing in Dell. You know, you know of course, we've all worked with Dell in one yeah. way or <laughs> other in our history. It's reinvigorating to be engaging with Dell today. Yeah. Right. And you work for a priority event, so you know the whole rip and replace argument. So here, what's interesting is, 
it's a, it's a, a very accurate, and, and by the way, we love the vision. You gotta deal with the legacy. Yeah. And you gotta bring in the new, shiny, new, cool, enabling tools that will help you go faster. Absolutely. But yet not on a rip and replace. Yeah. It's on a refresh basis. Yes. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. And you know, so now let's you know, talk one level down in terms of altitude of the technology implementation, right? So let's say you got vSphere implementation already, you got the traditional applications that are virtualized running on that, you realize the power of the new set of applications you can you know, run on OpenStack, but the reality is, is there a way I can technically, you know, can Nova talk to vSphere so that the control plane is still at OpenStack level so that I'm not having to go to separate schools because I have cloud in, right? So that opportunity has been already, you know, we've already delivered on that. You know, we, we work with VMware, of course, you know, there's a competitor as well, but as industry leaders, we work with them to make sure that we have a joint solution in place. So it all finally comes down to one thing we fundamentally wake up and believe in, which is start with the customer in mind, right? If you do that, you ain't going to go wrong, right? So <laughs> that's yeah. basically it. So, so Radesh, since, since you've brought up the VMware discussion, yeah. obviously, you know, Red Hat is a guest inside of VMware. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the big drivers I've heard in the marketplace is that OpenStack should drive uh, Rev adoption also. Mm -hmm. um, other than the, the, the push to OpenStack, yeah. um, can, can you tell me what other kind of real driving forces have there been to adopt you know, kind of KVM, your version of that, besides yeah. just I want to get off of you know the the, the VTAX, if you will. Right, right, right. Uh, since you've all, you used all the you know punchlines on VTAX, I'm not going to belabor on that. Now, let's look at a, a snapshot of where Rev as a product itself is. You know, first of all. The great starting point is that KVM is the best performing uh, hypervisor on planet Earth, uh, period, right? So look at spec word numbers, just blow them off the chart. Now Rev as a product has been in market for now five plus years, and it's reached a level of maturity that you know month to month call volumes are dropping 10%, whereas the subscriptions are going northward. Now you had a question about, hey, what is driving the growth of Rev? It finally comes down to two things. One is that, the attachment between Rev and RHEL, right? Because we are in this business model where every year we go back to the customer to renew the you know, RHEL subscriptions that they have. And given the VTAX, they realize that for starting with Linux workloads, it makes a ton of sense to use Rev, right? So British Airways comes as an example to my mind. Or CERN, for example, as a, uh, as a customer using that. So these are you know, big name uh, customers talking about you know, adding the second and third tier of workloads onto virtualization using rep because you know you can seven out of ten already have you know VMware, that's a fine thing. The second thing is from an architecture perspective, and this is where the cloud direction conversation we were having is uh, pertinent. What we've done in the last release of Rev and then the ensuing releases will continue to build on that is Rev becomes a consumer of some of the networking and storage implementations that you do on OpenStack. So which means that if an organization is investing in OpenStack, Rev gets a drag along with that because OpenStack is not architected for traditional workloads where you know the blinking lights have to be on all the time. So you have enough of those applications that can run on the Rev side of the equation. Either you take the sort of the front end web server part or even net new applications on the OpenStack side, but unless technically you're bringing these together, it becomes too silent. So that's what we've done to make sure that it's not just OpenStack, which is the drawbridge for getting into more rev footprint, but also the rel install base. So we're seeing tremendous success on both the fronts. Um, so another way to say it is, you know, OpenStack is the perfect tailwind that we needed to make sure that rev takes off in terms of adoption. Okay, so you're trying to make it pretty seamless for customers to move yeah. from RHEL to Rev and straight to OpenStack. Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely. so, you know, having lots of debates at this show about kind of the maturity of OpenStack. Mm -hmm. and if we look at it, it's kind of like a four-year-old startup with, right. you know, lots of different people, uh, you yeah. know, you put, putting pieces into it. When we think about technology adoption in general, whether it be, you know, Linux, uh, even, you know, virtualization with VMware, you know, it takes a long time to go from those early test dev deployments to production environments. Mm -hmm. um, you know, now that Havana's out, yeah. um, and, you know, Ice House is, you know, coming out, uh, yeah. you know, pretty soon, yeah. you know, 
where where are we? What use cases do you see customers doing? Um, you, you know, I, I don't hear too many customers saying I'm going all in. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, with my environments, but you know, what 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 customer momentum can you talk about or specifics there? Right. So you know, a couple of things to a vector here. Yes, indeed, it does take some time, and you know, you add to that enterprise lifecycle for evaluation and proving, and then you know, finally cutting the check, if you will. You know, that's just the physics of it. We are going through that. But the heartening thing is that, you know, every six months there is a release of OpenStack that's going on right now, driving the pace of innovation so fast. You know, the gaps that you're talking about, enterprise readiness, et cetera, they're disappearing so fast. You know, just to give you a couple of examples. One thing that people do give us feedback consistently on is, hey, look, the install configure experience in OpenStack, you know, it, it does require you to have some tacit knowledge. Guess what, in the June release that we're going to come out, which will be based on ISAs, we're going to solve that, right? Um, another one is about, hey, can you have high availability of the OpenStack services so that, you know, because this becomes the heartbeat of the enterprise, and want to make sure that it's up and running. We're delivering on HA across all levels, infrastructure, messaging, um, as well as database tiers in the next release, et cetera. So we're kind of systematically addressing the technical roadblocks to adoption. So that's one thing which is heartening. On the back of that, your question about use cases. Well, the use cases range from, you know, it's a normal curve just like any, um, you know, uh, technology adoption. On the extreme end, we have seen pure play OpenStack adoption, especially in Telco, for example, right? Um, it could be NFE, for example, Alcatel Lucent has picked Rail, Rail OpenStack platform as the platform for their cloud band solution. So every Alcatel Lucent customer by default is running OpenStack and is our OpenStack and we're excited about that. So that's more a pure play, OpenStack only, the usages around network function virtualization, et cetera. In the same bucket of sort of OpenStack only, uh, we also see some of the research institutions that I shared the names, right? So where it's not about, hey, I have a legacy application or what have you. It's more about I'm creating new net new either business model and or new you know app uh, experience, if you will, and OpenStack becomes a perfect uh, candidate for that. If you kind of come towards the middle of the you know normal code, that's where you see the customers either wanting to mix and match vSphere with OpenStack or Rev and uh, OpenStack and cloud forms, et cetera. So there's a lot of mix and match that's happening. And uh, so all, all signs indicate that, you know, especially given that the number of customers in the middle of the pack are going beyond just the initial kicking out the tires by the CTO to, hey, can we roll into production? This is going to just take off. You know, if you look at the next 12 to 18 month time frame, will be foundational, and then, you know, it would be uh, taking off. That's kind of the use. So, so, um the question I have for you is about the administrator. So, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things I think VMware's done a really good job is they really built a new role. Mm -hmm. There's the virtualization administrator, right. and VMware's trying to have them be the kind of the center of the universe. If you look yeah. at what they're doing with storage with vSAN, with uh, the NSX on the networking side, they're trying to yeah. give them new tools to do this. That's um, the, you know, the Linux admin, you know, has a lot of great tools, and I've seen that extending into a lot of environments. Cumulus Networks mm -hmm. is creating, you know, Linux for networking, mm -hmm. and, you know, Linux is very kind of extensible and programmable yeah. from its very nature. So mm -hmm. as you go from you know, Linux to virtualization to cloud, mm -hmm. um, can the Linux admin just do it all the way they have it, or are there new tools that you know, you're building in to help them and uh, you know, help pull them along that, uh, yeah. uh, that, that, that spectrum? So it's sort of yes and yes, if you will, right? So you know, the first part about, uh, it's our remit, right, to make sure that the RHEL administrators can graduate to the cloud with us, right? So that means even tactically down to training and certification, et cetera, we've got courses which take into mind because we understand the persona, what their needs are, so we've got that going. Now, um, there's also additional tooling and you know, tool chain that needs to be made available because the context changes a little bit. Earlier it was just about compute, now you got compute storage and networking to think about. So how do you, you know, have the right set of tools for managing lifecycle, for example? So if you have a, an offering called Satellite, which is for managing you know, bare metal or virtualized rel, now we are extending that into OpenStack too, so that you have a, a similar tool chain that you can use for managing the lifecycle of uh, OpenStack as well. So we're connecting all the obvious dots in terms of their starting point there being our, you know, uh, uh, we love to death RHEL administrators, if you will. Their tool chain, their learning uh, roadmap, everything we're thinking through to make sure that they can graduate and being able to 
you know, be at the center of the universe, which is the open universe as against the closed universe, if you will. So, so we're super excited about what's going on with you guys, especially this container thing. So that came up earlier. Mm -hmm. Virtualization has changed the game, certainly at the infrastructure yeah. level, but yeah. as the abstraction line yeah. moves up, DevOps guys don't have to worry about virtualization. It just becomes this cool thing that happens under the covers yeah. or under the hood that, mm -hmm. that works for them. Yeah. Containers is the new enablement. So yeah. we'll get your take on, uh, on, on that in context to OpenStack, because a lot of developers we talk to kind of piss and moan sometimes and say, hey, you know what? All this mud slinging around, OpenShift versus Cloud Foundry, it's just ridiculous. Just will OpenStack just fix that? So I want to ask you, where are we on this? whole OpenStack conversation, because there is a battleground in pass mm -hmm. that uh, is going on. It seems to be a lot of FUD going around. Mm -hmm. You guys are shipping product. You've got vendors stepping up and saying, hey, and like Dell and others saying, it's shipping. Yep. What, what was needed to happen in OpenStack? What is going to move that conversation to a much more productive place? Right, I mean, so let's agree on the fundamentals here, which is that the convergence of IAs and PaaS is a given, right? So you look at you know, Azure, look at you know, Amazon, look at Google, so you kind of take the math and bring, apply it on on-prem, it's going to happen, so that's a given. Now, that's a question of, hey, what's the best starting place? And that's a function of, which is your order of priority? Do you want pass and IAS today, or are you sequencing it in some fashion? You know, pass first or IAS first. I don't have any allegiance one way or other, <laughs> right? Love them all. But so, if you view from that perspective, then you know we have a great starting point with OpenStack from an IAS perspective. We have OpenShift, which is an offering that's available today, both on-prem and off-prem, that you can start. And the beauty of OpenS and the fact that you know you got you know uh, uh, definitely a, a seat in the cockpit, if you will, on both, is that we're working to make sure that they can converge together as well, right? So you know the answer, short answer is you know there is a place for all of these to exist, and even the ultimate consumption model is not just going to be passed on IAS because there's enough. There's going to be enough. I can you know take it from, you know read my lips. You know <laughs> definitely enough IAS only scenario that's going to be there. So we see a place for both and you kind of touched upon docker earlier yeah. and uh, I can you know kind of touch on that aspect well, as does well. this connect this docker yeah. and containers connect the dots so you're basically saying okay yeah. hey get the infrastructure service yeah. that's that's solid yeah. and whatever version of that yeah. pass pick your approach yeah. does the containers connect the dots on that piece? container you know can help connect the dots too but you know the, the key is to realize that the journey from an infrastructure perspective that we've had as you know, three stages in my head. The first stage was, how do you get to an application ready infrastructure, which was the rel uh, value proposition. You know, you have ISV certified, you know, the Apple run, so application ready infrastructure. Enter OpenStack, we have application aware infrastructure. You got things like heat where you can define an app and say, hey, the infrastructure knows, hey, I know the animal that's going to run on top of me. Sorry about the pure use of language here, but you get the idea, yeah, yeah. right? Okay. You can definitely yeah. characterize it and make sure that it behaves elegantly. The next is application optimized infrastructure where you're running enough of the operating system on top of a virtualized infrastructure so that the infrastructure is absolutely you there's know, no silver optimized. There's no silver bullet in all this. It's really about functionality. Exactly, I mean you need all three depending yeah. on the use cases, right? So you know, it's all about open and flexible in terms of choices. So I view personally Container and Docker specifically as a shot in the arm which will further the you know move away from the taxes that he you know your colleague was referring to, or you know the the, the problem with having making proprietary choices and bring in application portability. That's been the holy grail we're after, right? Well, the portability is fantastic, but also it speeds the delivery process on the app side too. So if I'm a developer, I like containers. And add to that efficiency and the cost saving associated with that. And there's more. You know what I'm saying? So it's I could amazing. talk about this forever. We're yeah. getting the hook, but I want to give you the final word. I really want to get this out there. There's been a lot of people saying, "Oh, OpenShift has got no traction." Clarify to the audience the traction around OpenShift relative to OpenStack. Right, so you know, I, I think my colleague Ashish Badani put out a blog a couple of days ago or like two weeks ago, which leads, lists out a few things, which is the fact that, hey, look, the number of apps that are there, the number of partners that we're working with, including Dell, I'm sure Sam would have touched upon that, or Cisco for that matter, is just increasing day by day, right? So, you know, there's no stopping that train. Um, and the beautiful thing is that the combination of OpenShift and OpenStack will make it into an express train, if you will. So that's the bet we've taken. We're getting the hook. Um, thank you so much for spending your time here. I know you're super busy. Uh, you know, it's like, it's like a track and field meet here for you guys. It's the big event, 10 years, congratulations. Again, virtualization changed the world. You got containers, you got the cloud, you got OpenStack. This is theCUBE, we're documenting it all here live in San Francisco. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break. Thank you.